19th century, a brutal class war was underway in the United States. And, as in all wars, the poor suffered the majority of casualties. American industry had the highest job accident rate of any country in the industrialized world. Approximately 35,000 deaths and 1 million injuries occurred in the workplace every year. Most workers were paid what amounted to a starvation wage. In 1890, Idaho's Commissioner of Labor Statistics detailed a 33-item standard budget for the American family, excluding all so-called luxuries from his analysis, including carpets, drapes, streetcar fares, medicine, and medical assistance. He concluded that the typical family required at least $549 per year to survive. Despite working an average of 60 hours per week, 88% of Iowa's laborers earned less than the required amount. Presiding over society was a small group of industrialists and bankers, nicknamed the Robber Barons. The richest 2% owned more than a third of the nation's wealth, while the bottom 40% possessed no wealth at all. In terms of property, the wealthiest 1% owned 51%, while the bottom 44% owned a meager 1.1%. Economist Henry George wrote in 1886 that chattel slavery is dead, but industrial slavery remains. Working people were fighting back with increasing militancy, and alongside the growth of labor unions was the growth of metropolitan police. During an economic depression sparked by the Panic of 1873, mounted police officers attacked thousands of protesters in Tompkins Square, New York. The NYPD then began assigning detectives to spy on socialist and anarchist groups. By 1896, they had tapped 350 phones, including those of churches. Workers were forced to contend not only with public, but private police forces. The largest of these groups was the Pinkerton Detective Agency. By the 1890s, the Pinkertons had amassed more agents than the entire standing army of the United States. During the Homestead Strike of 1892, when 300 Pinkertons were defeated by a guerrilla army of steelworkers, the National Guard came to the Pinkertons' rescue, protecting strikebreakers and defeating the Union. The Pinkertons did more than provide goon squads to big business. According to former Pinkerton detectives, such as Sam Hammett, the agency employed a wide variety of dirty tricks. These included infiltration, spreading false rumors, assassination, and false flag operations, acts of violence staged by detectives and blamed on workers. Among their targets were the Molly Maguires. Born of mysterious origins, the Molly Maguires were a secret society of Irish immigrants who became active in the anthracite coal fields of Pennsylvania during the 1870s. Victims of perilous working conditions and non-subsistence wages, they were blamed for a number of bombings and assassinations. Though historians agree that the Mollies engaged in militant activities, including the beating up of scabs, they are divided over whether they committed all, or even most, of the serious crimes attributed them. 
Joseph Rayback's 1966 volume, A History of American Labor, notes that the crime wave that emerged in the anthracite fields came after the appearance of the Pinkertons, and that many of the victims were union leaders and ordinary miners. The evidence brought against them, supplied by James McParlin, a Pinkerton, and corroborated by men who were granted immunity for their own crimes, was torturous and contradictory. On the 21st of June, 1877, 10 Irish American coal miners were hanged in Carbon County. 10 more Mollies would be hanged in the following two years. Miners and their families marched through the night to honor the dead. According to eyewitnesses, the crowd in Pottsville stretched as far as one could see. Over the next several decades, the workers' movement in the United States would become a powerful and revolutionary force. One of the most important labor struggles in the late 19th century was the Pullman Strike of 1894. When the American Railway Union organized a boycott against the Pullman Palace Car Company, workers came together in dozens of towns and cities in solidarity. The federal government stepped in to resolve the dispute, not on behalf of workers, but corporations. Seventeen years earlier, during the Great Railroad Strike of 1877, the government bloodily suppressed a rebellion sparked by massive wage cuts. Arms! This time, it would do so under color of law. There's this guy named George Pullman who gets a monopoly on sleeping cars for railroads, so a monopoly on everything to do with the technology of how to go from sitting up seats to flip them into beds so that people could sleep in them. He becomes a very rich man. And his major factory, which is in a suburb of Chicago, is in a company town called a Pullman. And, it's, and I always tell students, it's, it's a bad sign when the town has the same name as the owner of the major factory. That's kind of a clue. And so it's a company town. And that meant that everyone who worked for Pullman lived in a house owned by Pullman, shopped in stores owned by Pullman, their kids went to schools where the curriculum was controlled by Pullman. The police were picked by Pullman. So in 1893, the economy goes into one of these depressions and Pullman cuts his workers' wages, but won't reduce their rent. And the workers have the nerve to think that that's unfair. And so they go on strike. Now, 
back up a hair. In 1894, this is the summer of 1894, in the spring of 1894, there is a strike on the Great Northern Railroad. And the Great Northern Railroad was centered in St. Paul, owned by James J. Hill. When this depression hit, Hill cut his workers' wages. Railroad workers since 1888 had been developing a new kind of union called an industrial union. The idea was that all railroad workers, whether you were an engineer or a fireman, a brakeman, a conductor, a trainman, a maintenance of way worker who laid the tracks, that whatever you did, it made sense for all of you to be in one union rather than in a whole bunch of separate unions. And there was this very interesting, very charismatic guy named Eugene V. Debs, who started this union in 1888 that he called the American Railway Union. One big union for all railroad workers. Debs had started out as a fireman, that is the guy who shovels coal. Some guy has the wicked job of shoveling the coal and putting it into the boiler endlessly. So Deb starts this American Railway Union and the idea spreads among railroad workers. In 1894, in April, when the great northern workers are faced with this wage cut, they start a strike in Montana and the strike moves into St. Paul. And it's all the railroad workers together against this wage cut. And there is this great confrontation in St. Paul in April of 1894 between Eugene Debs and James J. Hill. And it's such a entrenched conflict that George Pillsbury steps in to mediate a solution because he's worried that as long as the railroad workers are on strike and the trains aren't running, his flour is not going to Duluth to be sent across the Atlantic Ocean. And so Pillsbury mediates a settlement that gives the workers back the pay cut. The word spreads throughout the country. Join that American Railway Union. That's the way to be safe and secure. So three months later, when the workers in Pullman, Illinois, experience their wage cut, they say, well, we're going to join that American Railway Union. And they contact Debs and they say, we built the trains. We built these Pullman cars. Can we join your union? Deb says, sure. They say, well, you know, we're already on strike. What can you do for us? Debs comes up with the idea that he will urge railroad workers throughout the country to boycott any train that has a Pullman car on it. Well, Pullman has a monopoly on these cars, which basically means every train has these cars, which means that Debs is really calling a nationwide railroad strike, but he doesn't want to use the words. Mr. Pullman sends his corporate lawyer, a guy named Richard Olney, who had been attorney general of the United States. Olney goes into a federal court in Chicago and calls for an injunction against the boycott on the grounds that every train also carries mail and that this strike is interfering with the shipment of the nation's mail. And a federal judge grants what is the first federal injunction against a strike. Under the command of Brigadier General Nelson Miles, 12,000 U.S. Army troops were sent in to attack their own citizens. Riots broke out in several cities. Before the smoke cleared, 30 strikers have been killed and 57 wounded. <laughs> 
property damage was estimated at $80 million. Charged with contempt of court, Eugene Debs delivered a speech before his accusers. It seems to me that if it were not for resistance to degrading conditions, the tendency of our whole civilization would be downward. After a while, we would reach the point where there would be no resistance and slavery would come. Debs was sentenced to 16 months in prison where he began reading socialist literature. He eventually renounced capitalism and went on to lead the American Socialist Party for the next several decades. Despite the solidarity expressed by workers during the Pullman strike, the union movement as a whole continued to be plagued by artificial divisions. Debs himself had previously supported the Chinese Exclusion Act the first immigration policy in the United States to prevent immigration on the basis of race. In the South, following the Civil War, racism was the most important factor in limiting the growth and effectiveness of organized labor. Well, certainly working people have different impulses that arise out of our situation. One of our impulses is to compete with one another because we have to compete for jobs and opportunities and schools and housing. We're constantly in competition with each other. Another of our impulses is to band together, to try to challenge our conditions, to stick together in solidarity and hope that by sticking together we can be stronger than the employers or the politicians or whomever may be oppressing us. And so we have competing impulses, an impulse to stick together and an impulse to compete against each other. And so when we ask the question about white people and black people in the South, especially working people, and who benefited, I think if we start from the perspective that something new and radical was possible out of the Civil War, then I think there's a, a strong argument that all working people lost out by the defeat of Reconstruction because the imposition of an extreme racist regime meant that the employers, North and South, would always have the card of racial antagonism, antagonism excuse me, to play against various groups, which they did quite effectively for a very long time. So we see unions participate in racism strongly. Um, speaking of, many of the first unions in this country were what you call craft unions, meaning that this group of people who have this craft are trying to protect their craft by, in some sense, banding together and having solidarity, but also, in some sense, competing with other workers whom they keep out of the craft and they exclude them. And so you see both impulses. It's like, we're going to stick together and we're going to exclude these other people. And by excluding them, we hope to maintain the high salaries and the benefits and whatever we can of the prestige and position of this craft. So a lot of unions take on that aspect, which very easily plays into race, racism. <clears throat> so white workers who participate in that kind of very strict exclusion would do horribly racist things like go on strike to prevent a black person from joining their ranks or you know being hired. Um, and so of course that benefits them in a sense that they get those jobs and they that that's their exclusive protected sphere. But from the perspective of what could they have achieved had their coalition or their potential coalition with working black people been realized, affirmed, strengthened, not crushed with violent racist terror, 
had that been allowed to flourish, had a genuine democracy and genuine land reform um, flourished in the South, had Reconstruction continued and been expanded, black people would have had property and wealth and working people would have had a very strong ally and they would have had a kind of, uh, who knows where that experiment in kind of workers' democracy might have ended up. So from the perspective of what was the possibilities that were opened up after, after the Civil War, I think we have to say the defeat of Reconstruction was a defeat for everybody. Racism was not the only means of keeping workers apart. In Latimer, Pennsylvania, ethnicity was the dividing factor. Over the preceding decades, immigrants had been arriving from Germany and Eastern Europe in desperate search for work. Slavic immigrants, in particular, were among the most exploited workers in the country. They were often used as strike breakers, causing anger amongst their native-born counterparts. Conditions in Latimer were so dangerous that thousands of workers had lost their lives since the opening of the mines in 1870. Yet, in 1897, coal companies actually lowered wages while simultaneously raising fees at the company store. They also instituted a so-called alien tax for new immigrants, exacerbating ethnic tensions. When a group of breaker boys went on strike in the nearby village of Colrain, Slavic workers were brought in as scabs. Yet instead of complying with their employer's demands, they joined the boys in solidarity. This was followed by another strike in which German and Eastern European miners came together in a united front. At first, their campaign seemed successful. The company quickly agreed to a 15% wage increase. But the bosses reneged on the deal. Refusing to back down, 300 unarmed workers marched to a coal mine owned by a man named Calvin Party. The response was savage. Nineteen unarmed coal miners were killed and another 30 wounded. Nearly all of the victims were shot in the back while attempting to flee. Despite the testimony of 140 witnesses, no convictions resulted. After the verdict, the Hazelton Daily Standard published a poem in protest. If the courts of justice shield you, and your freedom you should gain, remember that your brows are marked with the burning brand of Cain. O oh, noble, noble deputies, we always will remember your bloody work at Latimer on the 10th day of September. The brutality of the massacre inspired workers across the anthracite region to unionize under the United Mine Workers. Over 10,000 men joined the UMWA in the next three years. In Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, workers confronted yet another form of division, skill level. 
The dispute began when the owners of a silver mine introduced hole boring machines, displacing single jack and double jack miners. Many skilled workers were then forced into lower paying jobs. Additionally, mine owners raised working hours to 10 hours per day. There would be no days off. Miners would have to work seven days per week, with an occasional exception made for the Sabbath. The American Federation of Labor, created in 1886, represented only skilled workers and excluded what they called common laborers from their union. Yet in Coeur d'Alene, 3,000 higher pay miners stood in solidarity with 500 lower pay miners. Together, they demanded what they called a living wage of $3.50 per day. Spies from the Pinkerton and Thiel detective agencies were sent in to infiltrate the union, creating dossiers on key organizers. When the spies were uncovered, gun battles erupted, followed by an explosion at one of the mines. Several workers and one spy were killed, after which 60 private police surrendered. The detectives were taken prisoner and marched to the Union Hall, but were not harmed. While tolerant of violence by company spies against workers, the state government would not tolerate violence by workers against company spies. Martial law was declared and state militia called in to suppress what the governor termed insurrection and violence. 600 miners were arrested, denied habeas corpus rights and imprisoned in bullpens. The Pinkerton agent who had sparked the battle, Charlie Seringo, applauded the unconstitutional arrests, referring to the workers he had betrayed as unruly cattle. Veterans from the Coeur d'Alene strike went on to found the Western Federation of Miners, one of the most radical unions in the history of the United States. WFM President Ed Boyce stated in 1897 that they were open to every working man, whether engineer, blacksmith, smelter man, or mill man. The mantle of fraternity is sufficient for all. Workers were also mobilizing against prison labor and embracing unity in the process. According to the 13th Amendment to the United States Constitution, American citizens cannot be subject to involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted. This stipulation allowed for prisoners to be leased to corporations and used as strike breakers. Working class prisoners were treated as virtual slaves. In the South, blacks received the most brutal treatment. Records from 1880s Mississippi recount. The prisoners ate and slept on bare ground, without blankets or mattresses, and often without clothes. They were punished for slow hoeing, 10 lashes, sorry planting, five lashes, and being light with cotton, five lashes. According to historian Joy James, more African Americans died under the convict leasing system than during slavery. Calls by unions to eliminate these practices went unheeded by politicians, and workers in some states began taking matters into their own hands. 
In 1891, coal miners in Tennessee overpowered company guards, set 500 convicts free, and burned down a prison. An observer reported to the Chattanooga Federation of Trades that whites and Negroes are standing shoulder to shoulder. The divisions that labor organizers attempted to overcome during the late 19th century were also reflected in the political realm. From the time of the nation's founding, Americans had been divided into a caste system in which only the wealthy were deemed fit to make decisions on the public's behalf. In the Declaration of Independence, Thomas Jefferson defined the ideal of America, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The phrase had been borrowed from the English philosopher John Locke, with one significant alteration. The original read, life, liberty, and the pursuit of property. On the issue of voting, the Constitution had little to say and the matter was decided by individual states. Even among white males, majorities were often excluded due to property requirements. The most restrictive states were South Carolina and Virginia, where prospective voters had to own at least 50 acres of land. The link between wealth and voting rights sometimes caused unrest. In 1841, an uprising in Rhode Island sought to enfranchise poor immigrants. Led by Thomas Wilson Dorr, the uprising culminated in a failed attack against the state arsenal in Providence. Their cannon failed to fire, and the rebels were forced to retreat. By 1850, most states had eliminated property restrictions but poll taxes and other anti-democratic measures ensured that large numbers of Americans remained disenfranchised. The first literacy test for voting was enacted in Connecticut, 1855, and was designed to exclude Irish Catholic immigrants. In the South, following the Civil War, both black and poor white voters were disenfranchised the mere act of challenging this exclusion could be dangerous. According to historian Aaron Forner, every election in Louisiana between 1868 and 1876 was marked by rampant violence. During a contested election for governor in 1872, a mob of Democrats massacred between 62 and 153 African Americans after they attempted to take refuge in a courthouse in Colfax. The number of victims was difficult to establish as the bodies were buried in mass graves and thrown in the river. White people were not immune to terrorist violence when they attempted to defend black voting rights. In 1874, on the Red River in Louisiana, a racist militia known as the White League murdered six white Republicans and seven black freedmen. After being driven out of town, the victims were chased down by mounted gunmen and shot. The assassins were never brought to justice, in part because the White League, like the Ku Klux Klan before it, functioned as a paramilitary arm of the Democratic Party. 
The League's stated purpose was to defend a hereditary civilization and Christianity menaced by a stupid Africanization. The women's suffrage movement had begun gaining in strength during the late 19th century, with Wyoming becoming the first state to grant women the right to vote in 1869. Most battles were fought in the court of public opinion. The dominant attitude at the time was that men and women should have separate spheres of influence, and traditional attitudes among both sexes were slow to change. The women's movement was also plagued by the same racial and class bigotries that afflicted labor unions. There was a struggle within the women's suffrage movement because middle and upper class women tended to care less about the interests of the working class in general. So in Europe, there were property requirements to be allowed to vote. So most working class men didn't have the right to vote at that time. There was a debate within among socialists in Europe about whether to even support the right for suffrage for, for women if it didn't take up property rights. Because what it would effectively do is not only not um, help working class men, but it would also, deny, you know, if the same property rights are in place, you can be sure that working class women would also be denied the vote. So it really wasn't universal suffrage. The suffrage movement in the U.S. certainly had the opportunity and at certain points in the 19th century had united with the abolitionist movement and had united to fight for women's rights and for the rights of African Americans. Unfortunately, the dominant force in the suffrage movement turned away from that fight consciously and consciously did nothing to encourage black women to be involved and in fact included white supremacists within it. That's the fact. So that's been a dividing issue among radicals and socialists and so on. For example, the, the IWW didn't support the suffrage movement because they basically considered them just a bunch of rich white so-and-sos, you know, kind of thing. The Socialist Party in the United States did support the suffrage movement. So you could see how the possibilities for building a working women's suffrage movement were there. It was important. But ultimately, the suffrage movement did not break through the racial segregation. Despite restrictions on voting rights, suffrage had sufficiently expanded by the late 19th century to allow for a challenge to the two-party system of Republicans and Democrats. Embracing elements of both left and right-wing populism, the People's Party achieved widespread support in the South and Great Plains regions. At the core of their movement were impoverished farmers. In the same way that industrial workers became indebted to company stores, farmers became indebted to banks. When they could no longer keep up with interest payments, their land was repossessed. By 1880, 25% of all farms were rented by tenants. By 1900, there were four and a half million farm laborers. Many farmers suffered additional humiliation by being forced to work as wage laborers on their own former property. In the words of historian Lawrence Goodwin, the crop lien system became for millions of Southerners, white and black, little more than a modified form of slavery. Among the populists' planks, was the collective ownership of the means of production and distribution. They also declared that the interests of rural and civil labor are the same and demanded shorter working hours, as well as the elimination of private militias like the Pinkertons. 
In 1896, the Georgia State Platform of the People's Party denounced lynching and terrorism and asked for the abolition of the convict lease system. In at least one instance, populists prevented a black man from being lynched. They also pledged to create free public schools for both African American and poor white children. The uh, Democratic Party's history, its rootedness is in the Southern slavocracy. It was the party of Jim Crow, the party of slavery, for the better part of the first hundred or so years of its existence. When you come to the end of the 1800s, the Democrats are actually in power in Washington, a conservative Democrat, Grover Cleveland. It's the time of a huge economic crisis, not unlike what we've just been through, which leads to massive outbreak of struggle in both the cities and towns, as well as in the countryside. In the countryside in the South, this helps to create a movement, an interracial movement of farmers that then look for an electoral way to make their voices heard. And that's the beginning of the People's Party or the Populist Party. And for the early part of the 1890s, it actually competed with the Democrats in areas such as the South and in the uh, kind of rural Midwest. At that point, the Democrats and the populists both faced choices. The Democrats actually tried to adapt some of their rhetoric in order to capture some of the energy that was going to the populists. The populists themselves, initially successful on a fairly radical program, a number of politicians running, calling themselves populists, got elected and decided that instead of actually trying to build the party as an independent force to even replace the Democratic Party or to make the U.S. a three-party system, that it actually decided that it wanted to have a fusion with the Democrats. And the Democratic Party in uh, 1896 allowed that to happen, got the one politician that had any sort of semi-credibility with the populace, William Jennings Bryan, to run as a result of that. Not only then did the Democrats actually lose <laughs> the election and lose for the next 40 years, we're in a minority party, but all the energy was sucked out of the populist movement into this electoral dead end of the Democratic Party. I think in relationship to that, that the historian Howard Zinn wrote that one of the functions of the two-party system, particularly the Democrats, is to stamp out attempts at independence and to send out as one of its columns to go and surround, and using a kind of military analogy, to go and surround any possibility of a break away from the Democratic system, the Democratic two-party system, and to move it back into the fold. In the early 1900s, in a lot of places where the populace had been active, the Socialist Party became a strong force. It would be kind of hard to believe today, but the Socialist Party in the U.S. had fairly substantial support in places like Kansas and Oklahoma and Texas. You kind of think of this today as very conservative states, but obviously uh, wasn't always the case. Several small Socialist Parties kind of formed together in, I think, 1901 to form the Socialist Party of the U.S. And then for the next 20 years or so, its main probably spokesperson, probably the best popularizer of socialism in U.S. history, Eugene Debs, ran several presidential campaigns where he uh, campaigned on the socialist platform against the two main capitalist parties. The socialist party was, was not like a socialist party now. It was pre-Bolshevik, but farther left than anything we call socialist now. It wasn't like democratic socialist of America. It was very, very radical. It was uh, solidly Marxist, but it was very grassroots leadership. Eugene Debs was from southern Indiana, small town guy, and um, trade unionist. In Oklahoma, where I'm from, the Socialist Party was the, um, the Oklahoma Socialist Party was the largest per, cap per capita party of any state in the United States, and the largest in numbers of socialists outside of New York. Um, which is pretty amazing considering that Oklahoma is now right, right down there with the most reactionary. <laughs>
they did run presidential candidates, but mainly they were interested in local offices. So for instance, in Oklahoma, they actually controlled the majority of school boards, of county commissioners, and they did that in many states. Coinciding with the rise of the Socialist Party and radical labor was a new movement amongst the middle class, which sought to reform rather than replace the capitalist system. Christians began speaking of the social gospel. The Reverend Hosea Strong declared that Christ came not only to save individual souls, but society. Journalist Ida Tarbell wrote an expose of John D. Rockefeller that helped lead to the U.S. government's antitrust actions against Standard Oil. In 1906, the U.S. government passed the Pure Food and Drug Act in response to exposés of the unhygienic conditions in American meat factories. Progressives also attempted to curb the worst abuses of capitalism and to eliminate child labor. State after state, you start to see laws limiting child labor. You start to see national associations focused on it. And you see efforts by 1916, 1918, you see efforts at federal laws to set minimal age limits on who can work, although uh, these are ruled unconstitutional, not until 1938 with the Fair Labor Standards Act do you finally have a federal legislation to eliminate child labor. The Progressive Era got its name from a wide range and sometimes actually contradictory movements that tried to reform society. But at its heart, the Progressive Era was interested in finding some way to curb what was seen as the new excesses of the new industrial order and the new power of corporate capitalists, and to uh, solve problems of political corruption. Progressives had a lot of ways of doing that. Some thought and argued that the way to clean up the system would be to disenfranchise African Americans or disenfranchise immigrants. So not all progressives were what we think of today as progressive. But for many or most progressive reformers, the key question was what people of the day called the labor question. People were alarmed both at the rising inequality, also alarmed at seeing this new permanent working class amongst them, permanent proletariat that had little chance at achieving economic independence. The United States uh, had the worst record of any developed nation in the world when it came to industrial accidents. Something like 35,000 people a year killed in industrial accidents in the late 19th century, every year of the late 19th century. Despite achieving many positive reforms, the progressive movement had a dark side. Their ideas about religion and social health saw many progressives supporting authoritarian legislation, such as alcohol prohibition, and they often blamed the poor for their alleged moral shortcomings. Progressives also played a role in the oppression of Native Americans. A process of ethnic cleansing had driven indigenous peoples onto reservations where they held putative sovereignty, but were effectively powerless. The 1887 Dawes Act had allowed for communal tribal lands to be divided into allotments for individual families, which would be easier to sell. Federal policymakers worked with churches to impose Christianity as a part of what they called the civilizing project, imposing bans on traditional cultural practices, such as the eating of peyote and the sun dance. Decades passed before such policies were reversed. 
Although this ceremony was photographed recently, it portrays highlights of the ancient sun dance ceremony. From their homes on the reservation, the Plains Indians travel to the sun dance encampment. Only in automobiles, others still carry their camping equipment. Joe Newrobe lifts his buffalo robe from the wagon. As he carefully folds his precious robe, he remembers his grandfather who gave it to him. He will use his buffalo robe to help cover the sweat lodge. In the past, the sun dancers fasted and danced continuously for several days and nights. The sun dance was one of the most important tribal ceremonies of the Plains Indians. Today, the sun dance is fully understood only by the older members of the tribe. Perhaps the most disturbing aspect of the cultural assimilation program was the practice of removing native children from their parents and forcing them to attend abusive residential schools. In some schools, children had their mouths washed out with lye soap when they spoke their native languages. They could be locked up in the guardhouse with only bread and water for other rule violations. And they faced corporal punishment and other rigid discipline on a daily basis. Many students were sexually abused. In Nazi Germany, Adolf Hitler based his ideas about concentration camps and the practicality of genocide in part on the experience of American Indians. And there was another disturbing parallel. Eugenics, a pseudoscience based on the idea that poverty, crime, and other social maladies are caused by racial and genetic inferiority also had strong roots in the United States. The rich and powerful welcomed eugenics and gave lavish funding to the movement. Among its supporters were the DuPont family, the Rockefeller Foundation, the Ford Foundation, Mrs. E.B. Scripps, J.P. Morgan, and Harvey Kellogg. Tens of thousands of American people deemed unfit, mostly poor, disabled, and non-white women, were forcibly sterilized over the coming decades. Although the horrors of Nazi Germany brought eugenics into disrepute, programs in some American states continued until the 1970s. In the meantime, eugenics would play a major role in justifying discrimination against non-whites during the early 20th century. By this time period, the Republican Party was increasingly abandoning its support of African American rights. One of the most important figures in spreading awareness about lynchings was Ida B. Wells. Born into slavery in Mississippi mere months before the Emancipation Proclamation, she grew up to become a teacher at a black elementary school. In 1884, 71 years before Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat on a bus in Alabama, Wells refused to give up her seat on a train in Memphis. She was dragged out of the train car and unsuccessfully sued the railroad company in response. Wells went on to become an investigative journalist, publishing a pamphlet titled Southern Horrors 
Lynch Law in all its phases. She found that the traditional justification for lynching, black men raping white women, had zero basis in reality. Rather, lynching was a form of social control designed to terrorize black people and sublimate the anger of poor whites onto African Americans. The black community reached out to the labor movement for help, but from the time of the dissolution of the Knights of Labor in the 1880s, most unions had become exclusive clubs. Samuel Gompers, the leader of the American Federation of Labor, supported eugenics and regarded blacks and non-whites as inferior. A socialist during his early career as a cigar maker in New York, Gompers became increasingly reactionary as his power increased, eventually arguing in favor of what he termed racial purity. The AFL's primary competition during the time period presented a radically different vision. The industrial workers of the world, otherwise known as the Wobblies, eschewed divisions based on race, sex, creed, and skill. Union men, my ass. You won't be treated like men. You won't be treated fair. Well, you ain't men to that coal company. Your equipment, like a shovel, a gondola car, a hunk of wood brace. They'll use you till you wear out or you break down or you're buried under a slate fall and then they'll get a new one. And they don't care what color it is or where it comes from. It doesn't matter how much coal you can load or how long your family has lived on this land. If you stand alone, you're just so much shit to those people. You think this man is your enemy? Huh? This is a worker. Any union keeps this man out, ain't a union. It's a goddamn club. Now they got you fighting white against colored, native against foreign, holler against holler. When you know there ain't but two sides of this world, them that work and them that don't. You work, they don't. William Dudley Haywood, commonly known as Big Bill Haywood, delivered the IWW's first speech. A descendant of the original Pilgrims and a former leader of the Western Federation of Miners, Haywood famously remarked, I've never read Marx's Capital, but I have the marks of capital all over me. On June 27th, 1905, Haywood addressed a crowd at Brands Hall in Chicago. This is the Continental Congress of the Working Class, Haywood proclaimed. We are here to confederate the workers of this country into a working class movement that shall have for its purpose the emancipation of the working class from the slave bondage of capitalism. The IWW is the industrial workers of the world. It's a revolutionary union that was formed in the United States in 1905. The IWW shares many features with European anarcho-syndicalist unions, such as the CNT. Anarcho-syndicalism is a form of anarchism that developed in the 1890s in France and Spain that places a, a significant emphasis on building radical labor unions. Anarcho-syndicalism is really a strategy within the larger anarchist movement that suggests Anarchists can, can build power by creating revolutionary unions of workers. Workers will come together to, to form labor unions that can push for 
short-term reforms, such as shorter working hours or better pay. But as they're doing that, they're building their power to one day hold a general strike and overthrow capitalism itself. The IWW uh, was distinct from most other labor unions of the time because it tried to organize all workers into one big union. The IWW was openly anti-capitalist. It wanted to totally overthrow the wage system and to create a situation in workers owned the businesses that they worked in. Another feature of the IWW that distinguished it from other unions of the time was that it organized workers of all skill levels rather than simply the most skilled workers. It also organized workers across racial divides. It was welcoming and open to African-American workers and other non-white workers, as well as to women at a time when most unions were the preserve of white men. The industrial workers of the world were able to organize tens of thousands of workers in the decades between 1905 and 1925. They were kind of the culmination of the 30 previous years of very violent reaction of companies, corporations, to union organizing. One thing that was really unusual about the industrial workers of the world is that although they organized in workplaces, the workplaces shifted. These were shifting workers, workers who, who were really like migrant workers because they worked in the oil fields, in the mines. And these mines would open and close or the jobs they tried to organize, they would get fired. So whole families moved. They lived in encampments usually often in tents and dugouts around the mines, around the oil fields. In Oklahoma, where I come from, it was called the Saudi Arabia of North America back in the uh, 1880s, 1890s, early 20th century. So whole towns were, in fact, the town where Woody Guthrie grew up was one big oil workers encampment. And... These were very, very rough conditions. So it was very different from the you know, big industrial plants, the steel mills, where it was in place. It was much harder to organize. They moved around a lot, sometimes alone, sometimes with families. So they were a very, uh, it was a, a difficult population of workers to organize, just like, say, the farm workers were in the early 60s. The people who founded the Wobblies had that in mind. How do you organize? How do you have this kind of mobility and flexibility to go from place to place? Well, 
Despite their revolutionary ideas, the Wobblies advocated strict nonviolence. The same was not true of their opponents. In Fresno, 1910, the IWW successfully organized Mexican farm and construction workers, causing panic amongst business leaders. Migrant workers from Mexico had become a super exploited class, in large part due to their exclusion from unions. By challenging this exclusion, the IWW presented a real and present danger to the racial caste system relied upon by both corporations and trade union bosses. Heading up the struggle in Fresno was Frank Little, who described himself as half Indian, half white, and all IWW. He was arrested in September 1910. Before long, dozens of his fellow Wobblies were imprisoned alongside him. The mayor decreed that union organizers could only deliver public speeches if they had a permit from the government. On December 9th, a mob of vigilantes burned down the tent headquarters of the IWW, stole their belongings, and marched on the local prison where they threatened to break in and lynch union members. The police chief gave a tacit endorsement to the violence, stating, if the citizens wish to act, I will not interfere. Behind prison walls, activists were subjected to frequent beatings and a diet of bread and water. Wobblies responded with a campaign of civil disobedience. They refused to engage in prison labor. They demanded jury trials. And they kept up their spirits by singing labor songs. At the same time, Hundreds of other Wobblies were making their way to Fresno by train, establishing new camps and demanding the release of their comrades. Workers traveled from as far away as the Pacific Northwest. Finally, on March 11th, the ordinance limiting free speech was rescinded and the activists released from jail. They fought basically to just address their constitutional rights to free speech. The most dramatic of all of those fights was San Diego. There the city had passed an ordinance banning public speaking in kind of the heart of the business district. The industrial workers of the world had been going on soapboxes every single day, you know, to rail against capitalism and against industrial tyranny, to speak out for the rights of workers everywhere. And once this ordinance hit, they wanted to get up on their soapboxes even more. They put out a call to workers across the country to come to San Diego to test the new ordinance. And their idea was they would just get up over and over again onto the soapboxes and begin speaking. As soon as they got on the soapbox, they would be arrested. This was in 1912, they'd be sent off to jail. So their idea was to flood the jails with workers from across the country, paralyze the judicial system by being put on trial. And to a degree it worked. It messed things up mighty good in San Diego for a while. Ultimately, in San Diego, the Wobblies had to leave town and kind of give up the fight without a full victory. But historians of the right to free speech see this as one of the most important battles in U.S. history in terms of uh, fighting for and restoring the basic right to free speech. The Wobblies had been active in San Diego since 1906 and had helped organize Mexican migrant workers employed by the San Diego Gas and Electric Company. Their actions led to a raise in wages for workers and the establishment of a union shop. Strikes in the metalworking and brewing industries in nearby Los Angeles had also resulted in anti-free speech ordinances, leading to the arrest of over 500 workers 
During the conflict, a bomb exploded at the offices of the Los Angeles Times newspaper, killing 21 people and wounding dozens more. The dynamite was allegedly planted by James and John McNamara, two trade unionists belonging to the International Association of Bridge and Structural Iron Workers. Neither men had any connection to the Wobblies. The owner of the Times, Harrison Gray Otis, was despised by workers for his rabidly anti-union stance. Head of the most powerful chamber of commerce in the country, he remarked, we say to capital, here in Los Angeles, you can invest safely. Stand in back of me, and we will make this town union free. You're either with me or against me. Otis perceived the war between capital and labor in unabashedly militarist terms, referring to the Times building as his fortress and keeping caches of weapons in his office. As a reigning newspaper baron, Otis's position on unions was far from exceptional. In San Diego, the major papers were controlled by John D. Spreckles, whose street railroad empire had been targeted for organizing by the IWW's Local 13. When the Wobblies began gaining influence, an editorial in the San Diego Tribune stated, Hanging is too good for them, and they would be much better dead. They are absolutely useless in the human economy. The paper also advocated beatings, deportations, and other tactics of terror. This is what these agitators may expect from now on, that the outside world may know that they have been to San Diego. Spurred on by calls for bloodshed, three policemen attacked a 60-year-old free speech advocate named Michael Hoey. Repeatedly kicked in his stomach and groin, he was thrown in a prison cell where he was denied medical treatment for 40 days. Finally transferred to a hospital, he died shortly thereafter. In one demonstration, 5,000 people surrounded the prison. Authorities then used a new tactic that would be made infamous during the Civil Rights era. A journalist from the Oakland Globe reported, For a full hour, hundreds packed themselves in a solid mass, bending themselves to the terrific torrent that poured upon them. An old gray-haired woman was knocked down by the direct force of the stream from the hose. A mother was deluged with a babe in her arms. Two years earlier, in Fresno, the IWW had won its free speech fight largely due to the arrival of reinforcements, men who traveled long distances to support their imprisoned comrades. In San Diego, authorities were determined that this not happen again. A train full of Union supporters was stopped by 400 vigilantes carrying guns, knives, whips, and clubs. 140 men and teenage boys were kidnapped and taken to a cattle corral, where they were forced to run through a gauntlet and tortured for 18 hours. At the peak of the violence, America's most famous anarchist, Emma Goldman, arrived on the scene. A mob formed outside of her hotel room, chanting, Give us the anarchist. We'll strip her naked. We'll tear out her guts. Goldman was not physically assaulted. But her then lover, Ben Reitman, was not so lucky. A physician and pioneer of sex education in the United States, Reitman was kidnapped, branded, and sexually assaulted by vigilantes. While most of the San Diego press cheered on the violence, one journalist took a stand for free speech. 
after voicing support for union organizers. Abram R. Sawyer of the San Diego Herald was kidnapped, bound and gagged, and left in the desert with a rope around his neck. He remained steadfast upon his return, offering unique insight into the class dynamics of vigilantism. He noted that the personnel of the vigilantes represented the bankers and merchants, the Chamber of Commerce, and the real estate board. You know, the violence comes from the state and their, you know, goons. In this period back at that time, I would say people in the industrial workers of the world were nonviolent in all of their you know, all of their activities. It didn't mean they, they didn't defend themselves personally when they could, but they were, they were murdered, tortured, killed, hunted down, put in prison, locked up with a key, thrown away. All these trade unionists were, and it's really amazing the extent that they were able to use mass presence as a, um, a means of, you know, organizing and self-defense. Besieged by violence, some wobblies began losing faith in the idea that nonviolent civil disobedience and direct action would ever be sufficient to create what they considered a just society. IWW member Al Tucker swore that if he ever took part in another free speech fight, it would occur with machine guns or aerial bombs. Nevertheless, the Wobblies would retain their commitment to nonviolence and went on to lead successful campaigns in industries as varied as timber, construction, oil, agriculture, and garment manufacturing. Other activists were less forgiving. A small number of anarchists had already decided to respond to state and vigilante violence with a violent campaign of their own. They called it Propaganda of the Deed. The target, members of the international ruling class. Propaganda of the Deed was a strategy promoted by anarchists in the late 19th century and to a lesser extent into the 20th century. Anarchists always produced propaganda of the word, that is, they created newspapers and held uh, forums, debates, gave speeches. But the idea of propaganda of the deed goes to the general idea that actions speak louder than words. Propaganda of the deed stems from the idea that working class people are naturally rebellious, that they're angry about their conditions of life, and that there's an inborn tendency of them to rebel. Many anarchists thought that masses of working people would rise up in a fairly spontaneous way, as they had in a, at a number of times and places in Europe uh, in the 19th century. Propaganda of the deed was meant to encourage such spontaneous uprisings. <laughs> <laughs> 
In a sense, anarchists thought that an act of political violence might serve as a trigger that would set off a larger social conflict. Some of the most notorious acts of propaganda of the deed were assassinations of leading industrialists and political figures, military generals, and other members of, of the elite. Anarchists hoped to show workers that it was possible to resist authority figures, even when they seemed invincible. Propaganda of the deed would also find support in the United States. Though few dissidents were willing to advocate violence publicly, a small number did so at considerable risk to their own lives. One example was Lucy Parsons, whose husband, Albert Parsons, was involved in the Haymarket Affair of 1886. He was among a group of anarchists charged with conspiracy after a bomb was thrown at police during a rally for the eight-hour workday. Four of them, including Albert Parsons, were hanged. The anarchist leaders, including Albert Parsons, were in a coffee shop several blocks away, talking and making a plan. When the violence broke out, they weren't even present, but they were put on trial. The leaders were put on trial. Albert Parsons was the only native-born. He was a Texan. He was actually a Confederate officer in um, the Civil War. But then he met Lucy Parsons, who's actually African-American, and probably had been in slavery. but shadowy. She never wanted to talk about her past. But they fell in love, and um, this changed Albert from, you know, clearly a Confederate racist, <laughs> Confederate officer, to a person who was a leader in the Reconstruction in Texas. They couldn't get married because of segregation laws against black and whites marrying. Their lives were in danger because they were an interracial couple. And I'm sure it also had to do with his, you know, becoming a progressive Reconstructionist as well. So they went to Chicago, the great gathering place for radicals from everywhere. And there they threw themselves into organizing. And then they had two small children. They had only been married probably 10 years when he was killed. She lived on into the 1950s, long, long life of organizing. She was a promoter of using violence. She spoke once to a, um, in the South, to a, a group of African-American sharecroppers in a church. She got up and she talked about segregation and she says, but you are not powerless. Never think you're powerless. And she takes out a um, match and strikes it, you know, one of those big kitchen matches. And she says, you always have this. So it's like, burn it down. <laughs> Even more vociferous was the German immigrant, Johann Most, lamenting all the wealth of this great republic is the property of a handful of cunning schemers. He argued that the existing system will be quickest and most radically overthrown by the annihilation of its exponents. Inspired by Most's call to arms, a Russian immigrant and anarchist named Alexander Berkman decided to take revenge against Henry Frick of the Carnegie Steel Company. During the Homestead Strike of 1892, Frick 
had used Pinkerton detectives to assault workers. Berkman's gun jammed after the first shot, causing him to fail in his task. He was sentenced to 14 years in prison. A year after his arrest, Berkman's friend and lover, Emma Goldman, delivered a speech to unemployed workers in Philadelphia. Urging them to steal bread if they were denied work, she was arrested for inciting to riot. Authorities offered to drop the charges in exchange for her becoming an informant. She responded by throwing a glass of ice water in her interrogator's face. Goldman was imprisoned for one year at Blackwell's Island Penitentiary. Upon release, she was met by cheering crowds. Emma Goldman was uh, perhaps the most notorious anarchist in the history of the United States. She was born in 1869 and immigrated with her family to the United States a few years later. She lived in Rochester, New York uh, as a teenager and as a young woman and worked in a garment factory there. In the late 1880s, she became aware of the Haymarket Affair in which a number of anarchists were imprisoned and later executed for supposedly throwing a bomb at a number of police officers. This enraged uh, Emma Goldman and it also uh, promoted her interest in anarchism. She wanted to learn more about the political beliefs of these people that she saw as martyrs to the cause of economic justice. For the most part, Emma Goldman was self-educated. She learned a lot from just engaging in dialogue and debate with many other activists in the movement, from reading classics of anarchist thought, such as the writings of Peter Kropotkin. And uh, she taught herself to read a variety of, of foreign languages. Uh, newspapers were being created, and, and anarchists met in a number of groups. They had social clubs. They frequently held street protests. They helped workers form unions. And she became very involved in the movement. Goldman was an eloquent speaker and an uh, intelligent and original thinker as well. She traveled throughout the country talking about anarchist ideas and values. She promoted worker organization and she defended the rights of workers to resist their exploitation with violence if necessary. In some ways, Emma Goldman broadened the anarchist movement to address a variety of other issues beyond economic injustice. For example, she was a leading advocate of free speech in the United States and for the rights of immigrants in the United States. She was also a staunch defender of women's rights to control their own reproduction. And in this way, by beginning to address a variety of issues beyond economic injustice, I think Emma Goldman helped to broaden the base of supporters for the anarchist movement in the United States in the uh, 1900s and 1910s, the decades before the First World War. In 1901, Goldman delivered a speech attended by a poor immigrant named Leon Scholgosch. Scholgosch had become unemployed when Andrew Carnegie sold his steel interests to J.P. Morgan. The exchange made Carnegie the world's wealthiest man. It also put Leon Scholgosch out of a job. He went on to purchase a train ticket to New York and a 32 caliber Ivor Johnson revolver. Renting a room in Novak's hotel at 1078 Broadway, he took in some of the sights. Then, on August 31st, he shot the president. William McKinley died one week later. Scholgosch's action had more profound repercussions than he himself had anticipated. After the dissolution of the populist movement in the late 19th century, McKinley 
had been backed by the nation's wealthiest men to run under the Republican ticket against the Democratic candidate, William Jennings Bryan. But the robber barons were also frightened by the up-and-coming Republican, Teddy Roosevelt, who had campaigned against corporate monopoly. Roosevelt had been enticed into assuming the inconsequential position of vice president. After McKinley's assassination, Roosevelt assumed top command and began antitrust actions against some of the most dominant corporate monopolies, including U.S. Steel. Although Goldman had no links to Shulgosh, she was blamed in the media for inciting him to violence. Remarkably, she refused to condemn the assassin. Referring to McKinley as the president of the Money Kings, who had betrayed the trust of the people, she denounced him for the Spanish-American War of 1898. The Spanish-American War represented the ascendance of the United States as a major world power, allowing for the new republic to establish control of the former Spanish colonies of Puerto Rico, Guam, Panama, Cuba, and the Philippines. During the campaign, over one million Filipinos were killed. Goldman's refusal to distance herself from Sholgosh angered some of her previous supporters. For a time, she abandoned activism and took up full-time work as a nurse. But Goldman found it impossible to remain in the shadows. She re-emerged when Roosevelt began a campaign against anarchists far more severe than anything he would undertake against the robber barons. He promised to crack down, not only against anarchists, but against all active and passive sympathizers with anarchists. In 1903, the U.S. Congress passed the Anarchist Exclusion Act, which allowed for the exclusion and deportation of immigrants with anarchist beliefs. Following a speech by Scottish anarchist John Turner in New York, the Bureau of Immigration arrested him and threatened deportation. Goldman petitioned the lawyers Clarence Darrow and Edgar Lee Masters to argue on his behalf. Despite support by free speech groups, Turner lost the court battle and became the first person deported under the new law. Goldman never directly participated in propaganda by the deed, but her former lover and lifelong friend, Alexander Berkman, spent 14 years in prison due to his action against Henry Frick and the Carnegie Steel Company. Berkman was released in 1906 and went on to edit Goldman's newsletter, Mother Earth. Leon Sholgosh, assassin of President McKinley, was executed in 1901 by a ghoulish new invention the electric chair. This recreation, filmed for Thomas Edison's film company at Auburn Prison, shows Sholgosh's final minutes. The electric chair was conceived as a more humane alternative to hanging. However, some states later determined that it constituted cruel and unusual punishment. of violence against elites would continue throughout the early 20th century, but most anarchists remained nonviolent and regarded propaganda of the deed as a tactical failure. In the late 19th century, many anarchists promoted or supported propaganda of the deed. However, they found that propaganda of the deed typically did not spark the larger uprisings that they hoped it would. Instead, it brought down severe repression by police and other government forces. Teddy Roosevelt's war against anarchists coincided with a much more far-reaching program that would revolutionize policing in the United States. Following the great anthracite strike of 1902, a commission was formed by Roosevelt that went on to recommend the creation of not only 
municipal, but state police forces. The commission suggested that peace and order should be maintained at any cost, but should be maintained by regularly appointed and responsible officers at the expense of the public and at the request of various companies. The new police forces would socialize the cost of policing, reducing the need for massive expenditures by corporations on private armies like the Pinkertons. In terms of the privatization of the police, this comes and goes in waves, has throughout history. There are periods where there's a tendency to creating private police forces, and then there are periods where the emphasis goes back onto the public police forces. And this tracks pretty closely the demand to the business community, and especially in response to class tension and usually labor unrest. During the early 20th century in Pennsylvania, the uh, coal and iron companies had their own private police force called the Coal and Iron Police. They were actually uh, chartered by the state of Pennsylvania on the terms that the companies paid the state a dollar per officer and therefore they had arrest powers and that sort of thing. But it was really just a private army run by the companies for the sake of breaking strikes. Now why was this needed? It was needed because the, in small towns, the police forces were generally very small, also had direct community ties, were often related to people in the workforce, and were not particularly excited or good at the kind of strike breaking that the companies needed them to do. So instead, they could raise this private army, recruit from you know, everywhere, didn't have the same problems, it could just deploy it wherever unrest was happening. The problem is it's really expensive to maintain a private army. So as the period of unrest faded, the business community pressured the state government to take over the coal and iron police. And they literally did just like transfer it from private organization to public organization. The Pennsylvania State Constabulary was created, you know, exactly the same guys doing exactly the same work. Again, mainly focused on breaking strikes. And that was really the first modern state-level police force. Once Pennsylvania created it, within a few years, other states started replicating the model. Very shortly, every state had one. In May 1905, Pennsylvania Governor Samuel Pennypacker created what would become the dominant model of policing in the United States. The end result for workers was remarkably similar to what they had experienced under the rule of private detectives. In 1911, S.P. Bridge of New Alexandria described the role of the Pennsylvanian police in a labor strike. Gentlemen, state police came to New Alexandria July 31, 1910, Sunday. The state constabulary are of no use in this country to farmers or working men. They make all efforts to oppress labor. I cannot see that anyone but the coal company is benefited. Despite constant oppression, the workers' movement continued to grow in strength during the early 20th century. The need for strong unions was made clear not only by low wages, but also by the extreme dangers inherent to many low-paying occupations. In 1907, 367 men and boys were killed in a mining accident in West Virginia, the deadliest in U.S. history. The disaster produced headlines around the world and led to the creation of the United States Bureau of Mines, but little was done to increase the safety of workers. Female workers were also subject to dangerous conditions. As technology advanced, women and girls were increasingly exploited in low-paying jobs. Between 1880 and 1900, the number of employed females rose from 2.6 to 8.6 million. While some women enjoyed rewarding professions, such as schoolteacher, the majority faced miserable working conditions, and in some cases, death. In New York City, 
in the Greenwich Village, there was a substantial garment industry in the early 20th century. And it mostly employed women, and most of the women were immigrants, particularly from Italy and from Eastern Europe, mostly Jews and Italians, quite young. 12, 13, 14 years old was not unusual. And these were sweatshops. These were workplaces with terrible working conditions and a great deal of pressure on the workers. In 1909, there was a strike that had a little bit of success in getting some better wages and some better working conditions. But one of the shops that had not been converted by the strike was the shop where this fire would take place in 1912, the Triangle, what was called the Triangle Factory. And uh, shirtwaists were uh, one-piece garments that, that women wore. Um, and so they were pretty easy to mechanize the making of them. The fire broke out on the eighth and ninth floors of this factory. The fire trucks had ladders that only reached the seventh floor. It came out that the employers had locked the doors because they were afraid that workers were either taking breaks or stealing cloth. And so they would lock them in when the workday, when the shift began. Many of the girls jumped to their deaths in front of hundreds of witnesses because people were drawn by the fire. And 146 young women died in this fire. Strikes during the late 19th and early 20th centuries failed at least as often as they succeeded. But each victory served as an inspiration for workers across the country. One of the most remarkable labor actions from the time period was the Lawrence Textile Strike of 1912, which involved immigrants from over 40 different nationalities, both men and women. Working conditions in Lawrence were atrocious. Six-day work weeks of 60 hours were the norm. Workers were sometimes punished just for speaking to one another, and many grew ill from breathing in toxic fibers. On average, textile workers died 20 years earlier than the national norm. Most of them lived in dirty, overcrowded slums where the infant mortality rate was among the highest in the nation. Leading the strike were the industrial workers of the world, otherwise known as the Wobblies. Big Bill Haywood, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, Joseph Ettor, and other activists organized the resistance. Before long, police began attacking the picket lines. So they arrested the people that they considered to be the quote unquote leadership of the strike, who they assumed were men. And then they were shocked and horrified when despite these arrests and removing the male lead, you know, so-called leaders that women were at the front of the picket lines leading the strike. And the way Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, who's one of the most effective labor organizers of the IWW at that time, a young woman known as the Rebel Girl, she said people often accuse the IWW of pushing women to the front. In reality, we don't hold them back and they move to the front. As winter set in, workers decided that their children should be temporarily sent to the homes of sympathizers in New York 
and Philadelphia. At the train station, police brutally beat women and children, causing one woman to miscarry. The assault against women and children produced a national outcry, and donations poured in from around the country. With help from members of the Socialist Party, the Wobblies set up soup kitchens, food banks, and medical clinics. Joseph Edor advised against any resort to violence, stating, you cannot win by fighting with your fists against men that are armed or against the militia, but you have a stronger weapon than they have. You have the weapon of labor and they cannot beat you down if you stick together. Sensing the truth of Edor's statement, William Madison Wood, the owner of the American Woolen Company, and John Barron, a local businessman, decided to engage in violence on their behalf. They hired a mill contractor named Ernest Pittman to plant dynamite in several locations around the city with the goal of framing the union leadership. Although Pittman confessed to the crime, none of the conspirators received any jail time. On January 29th, a striking worker named Anna Lopizo was shot and killed by a policeman. The next day, another striker, John Ramey, was bayoneted to death by a U.S. soldier. Instead of arresting the murderers, authorities decided to charge two strike leaders, Joseph Eder and Arturo Giovanniti. They spent several months in jail, but were ultimately acquitted by a jury. Despite the involvement of police, state militia, Pinkertons, and even U.S. Marines, the Lawrence textile strike was successful. Workers not only reversed the pay cut, but achieved a raise in wages with overtime pay. Equally important, the strike drew national attention to workplace safety issues, child labor, and the dismal living conditions of the American working class. In the months after the Lawrence strike, 250,000 textile workers won pay increases. When the union's inspiration through the workers' blood shall run, there can be no power greater anywhere beneath the sun. Yet what force on earth is weaker than the feeble strength of one? But the union makes us strong. Solidarity forever. us in the surf, the man would crush us with his might. Is there anything left to us but to organize and fight? For the union makes us strong. Solidarity forever. Solidarity forever. cities where they trade, dug the mines and built the workshops, endless miles of railroad laid. We stand outcast and starve amidst the wonders we have made, but the union makes us strong. Solidarity forever.
alone by idle drones is ours and ours alone. We have laid the wide foundation, built it skyward stone by stone. It is ours not to slave in, but to master and to own, while the union makes us strong. Solidarity forever. Solidarity forever. Solidarity forever. For the union makes us strong. They have taken untold millions that they never toiled to earn. But without our brain and muscle, not a single wheel can turn. We can break their haughty power, gain our freedom when we learn that the union makes us strong.